Hi, Brian. Welcome to Venture with Grace today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, you have a really cool background. You were working for brand. Ma- uh, you were working at um, Twitter for brand partnerships, and then you were the head of sales at Reddit. And before you got into angel investing, and you were running e- your own like syndicate and SPVs before joining Craft. Um, to start of the show, would you want to share a little bit more about like how you got started in venture and tech? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I have a, a bit of an unorthodox background for for getting into venture. Um, I, as you said, I, I started my career. I graduated college, started my career in sales, worked at CBS, and then I went to Twitter, or now known as X, and then Reddit. Um, and so when I was at CBS and Twitter and Reddit, I, you know, I was working and, and working with big customers and clients in the Fortune 500, um, but I was also working with startups and really fell in love with working with those teams and those founders. And basically, you know, as soon as I was in a position where I could start writing checks myself, I, I started doing that. So that was that was when I was at Reddit, um, started making angel investments, fell in love with it. And then, um, you know, as you kind of alluded to, started a, a syndicate where I started investing even even more. Mm. I wonder when you were, um, so I guess like, when you, when I'm looking at your portfolio, so you have invested in Bonobos, uh, Lambda School, Citizen, Slack, Carta, and DocuSign. Um, can you give us an overview on like, let's say when you, um, if someone's like first started Android investing, what should be their roadmap to getting into the most competitive deals? And how do you kind of evaluate um, what deal to get in before they become a really oversubscribed round? Yeah, I mean, I think... Um... Really, it is. It's a couple of things. One is is like, what are you? What you know? What are you interested in? What types of startups? What types of companies get you excited? Um, and then also figuring out like how you can be helpful. So as a as a small individual investor, when you try to invest in like a hot startup that's demanding a lot of attention from venture capital, like they don't, you know, they're not. You're not that important to them, and so you have to find a way to um, get in the door with them. And so for for me, like I spent a lot of time working with startups on their acquisition marketing. When I was at Reddit, there's a lot of community building. So some of the startups I would invest in, those founders would find value in me helping with their marketing team when they were spending money on Facebook or Twitter or Reddit ads or doing community building. So it was a bit of like matchmaking between, I think this is an interesting startup and team and I'd be interested in investing, but like, here's, here's why, here's how I could be helpful. And here's why you would even bother taking a, you know, a pretty small check from an individual uh, because it's, it's a bit more of a headache for them. So it has to be, be worth it. So it spent a lot of time just, you know, trying to convince them like wh- how I could add value and, and go from there. Mm. I wonder, um, so when you are thinking about investing in emerging manager today, what are things that you would look for to partner with the emerging manager? And since you are also running the Craft Scott program, I wonder, like, how do you figure out, um, I guess, like, how do you kind of, like, do the mental roadmap on, like, what kind of relationship you would like to build in the ecosystem? And how do you... um, navigate your way to build those relationships yeah i mean it's not it's not that dissimilar from from like picking founders um like we're looking always looking for outlier individuals building companies or as as an investor from the you know from the investment perspective you know i've i've done some you know invested in some funds um i've helped david Sachs, a partner at craft with some of his uh personal investing and really look for uh, managers that have unique deal flow. So there's, a, you know, there are a lot of deals that like kind of everyone sees, and there's a lot of the same emerging managers and the same deals. And that, you know, that's could be fine if those are good deals. But um, we're really like looking for for managers who are getting into unique deals early before kind mm-hmm. of the, the crowd. And so oftentimes, you know, in the past, that's been, you know, sometimes I've come across a company. Maybe it's at the seed or the series A, and I think it's super interesting. And maybe we invest, maybe we don't, but it's it's really interesting. And I'll look at the cap table to see who invested at the pre-seed. And sometimes you'll you'll see some managers just who are off the radar, who don't have huge names getting in there early. And so that like that would be a signal to me that that's someone I would want to meet and spend time with and get to know better. Mm. Um, how do you find out who was on their cap table before? 
Uh, so is this like fought by like pitch book or something? Like how it, 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 could, it could, yeah. I mean, it could quite literally be like, yeah, pitch book or crunch base, or it could be like if, if we're doing real diligence, like we get cap tables and could, could see the actual cap table or they'll just share with mm -hmm. us, you know, I'll, you know, when they talk to, to us about their fundraising history, they'll share, you know, we've raised $500,000 from angels such as, so, so yeah, stuff like that. Mm. I wonder, so for the people who, like, I assume you interact with a lot of people who see these, like, really unique deals before they become popular. I guess, like, what characteristics do they share? And then how do they fund these deals? And if there's, yeah. like, any, yeah, any patterns on, like, um, people finding them repetitively, um, do people go for like a um, spray and pray perspective? Like, oh, let's just talk to every YC founder or how how do they even found these deals? Yeah, it, it depends. And I, th I think everyone has different styles and different styles could work. So, you know, um, doing a ton of investing and investing in a bunch of startups and not paying any attention to them isn't isn't great. But if you invest in a, in a lot of startups and you're really good at picking the winners and doubling down, you know that's interesting. But a lot of the manager emerging managers I've seen, um, they're they're pretty concentrated. They're pretty picky about where they invest. Oftentimes, um, sometimes they're generalists. Sometimes they're really focused on a specific category. So it it really depends. Um, but almost always. Like they have a unique, there's always a unique story of how they met that founder. It's not as simple as like, I read about it, you know, on one of the the news on TechCrunch, and then I reached out to the founder. It's, you know, a friend of a friend went to school with them and it was the smartest engineer and, you know, person in the class or, you know, wh whatever it is, there's always kind of a unique story. <clears throat> um, I do think like just certain, certain people have a knack for, for finding really talented people. Um, and they kind of have like this the spidey sense that this is a special mm -hmm. founder or team or whatever it is and so you know we try to find those people um and that's a you know big part of our job mm. i wonder when when it comes to like um since like you're investing at craft right now so when it comes to like source pick and when ag ag and then exit can you share more about like you know what's your unique like advantage on sourcing or picking or winning like what do you see as your major like unfair advantage and how do you kind of like build up that unfair advantage throughout time yeah i mean well it's, it's a few things i mean one one of the things that at craft is you know almost everyone here has been an operator or a founder so we've sort of like been in the trenches building companies or teams we've we've seen good companies good teams wins losses like we've you know we've we've done that um, so I think that is is super helpful, especially when we're in the job of like picking founders. Um, so you know that that's that for for me personally, like I come from a, a sales background, and so I often will you know use the the sense of if if I you know we're still in sales today and going to go run a, a sales team, like I would do diligence on the company of you know is this a product I could sell and build a team around, and I'm going to get equity in the company, so it's going to be worth something. And so oftentimes when I look at a company, I think to myself, like, would, would this have been a company I'd be excited to go to go sell at, basically? Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, we we partner with founders um, really closely. We have a platform team where we have we bring in folks to help with recruiting, government relations, uh, marketing. And so we we do a lot to try to be helpful. And sometimes it means being super hands on. Sometimes that means staying out of the way. But um it's 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 a lot of fun and and it's been been a great time doing it. Mm, I wonder when it comes to let's say, um, like in the past, like um, I think we chat about like you were um the your approach to let's say Citizen or some other company. I guess like when you're looking at um, can you walk us through like any particular deal that you've done to like from like how you see it, how you like encounter them to how you decided to invest and how how did that deal go yeah um it doesn't have to be said you know, it could be like any of your reason deal too yeah um i mean there's been there there's been been a few i mean you know one, one of the deals i work really closely on at craft is called click up um and they mm -hmm. um they they compete with asana um and uh monday.com and basically we 
I, I had seen um, that that company was growing super fast. There was a bunch of buzz, you know, on them on Reddit and on different forums. We had portfolio companies that were using them organically, and we were just taking notice of that. And so got to know that team and, and that founder um, and they weren't raising at the time, but kind of like how to stay really on top of it. And again, like find ways to be helpful because busy founders don't want to just talk to an investor. And so worked really hard at getting those meetings, setting up time and ultimately, you know, making sure it's a good, a good, a good um, partnership. The, um, you know, Dapper Labs, which was when I invested in, in Dapper Labs, it was CryptoKitties. That was like, I just, I was reading about it. I read about CryptoKitties. It sounded like this fun, wacky thing, but a big piece of it was community and their Reddit in particular was going crazy over it. And so I emailed the founder and, you know, introduced myself as someone who works at Reddit and is interested in angel investing. Uh, and that like, I'd be happy to be helpful and a resource for anything community related or, or Reddit. And luckily it was like perfect timing and you know, within a day or two, you know, I was, I was wiring into, into that company and that was, you know, series A when it was, I think it was Union Square Ventures and Andreessen and Harvest was, was leading the round. Uh, but every, every deal is different. Every deal has a different story. And so that's what kind of keeps us fun. Mm, I feel like, you know, be, having an advantage or like working at a like well-known company is certainly helpful, but like, you know, there's a lot of, Nowadays, there's a lot of operator angels. Like, um, I guess, how do you like if you are starting out today without your current track record? Um, how would you kind of find out about these deals before they were, uh, you know, Series A led by like a really famous firm? And um, like, how would you create a system for yourself to have that deal sourcing process? And how do you kind of be friends with? like people in the industry that kind of um, are influential in terms of like making investments? Yeah, um, it's it's a bit of a loaded question because it, it, it really, really depends. Um, you know, like for for me, given my background was was marketing and sales, I would I would reach out to investors at top tier funds and introduce myself as an angel investor and also just as a resource for them if, if because they're investing in companies, they're on boards of companies, mm -hmm. and some of their companies need help with marketing or Reddit or Twitter. And so I would make myself available as a resource for them and their portfolio companies and get to get to know them. Um, so it, you know, and, and that, but that takes time, you know, like it, it took time to go from first job to second job to third job, and then to have enough expertise to actually be helpful and, and interesting enough. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, I think, you know, if you're, if you're kind of starting out now and you're interest, interested, like it's, it's a lot of hustle and it's a lot of creativity mm -hmm. and there's not one roadmap. Um, ultimately mm -hmm. it's, it's adding value. It's bringing interesting deals to investors um, it's getting into good deals, but how you do that, um, you know, that, that's the thing is like, you, you have to be creative and entrepreneurial, um, and scrappy with doing it, uh, find a way to, to actually be helpful and interesting to a founder, to an investor. If you can't do that, then like, you know, you're, you're kind of out of luck. Like there's no, no one's going to tell you like, this is exactly how you do it. I don't know that there's like ever going to be a book on this is this is how you do it. Um, one of the other things I would say is, you know, once you're in a, a financial position where you could invest, angel investing in other people's deals and SPVs, I think is a great way to learn. That's something that I did. I was able to write, you know, a thousand dollar check into other deals and, and learn. And I sort of justified that as like, instead of getting a formal MBA, mm -hmm. like I'm going to invest money into a bunch of deals and just learn. And that was super helpful for me. Mm. I wonder when you are putting, let's say, 1K check into deals, what are things are you trying to learn about? And then like since like um, if we're writing a small check into something like I feel like the funders aren't necessarily going to share their life struggles with us that much. So I guess I wonder like um, number one is like what's your intention on learning from these deals and how do you kind of access to the things that you're trying to learn since, um, you know, it's such a small track and then people may not be, um, sharing a lot of information. Yeah. And every deal, every SPV, every syndicate is, is, is different. Um, so, mm -hmm. 
some deals had a lot more information and financials than others. Um, it's also like the syndicate lead. So, so, you know, sometimes I would, I would actually have a relationship with the person who is, who is syndicating the deal and they were able to, I was able to at least have a, a phone call with them where they could tell me why they're so excited about the, the deal. And sometimes they would convince me to invest because they've known this person for 10 plus years and it's the you know best person they know and they invested in their previous startup. But then sometimes, you know, they it wouldn't sell me. Like they were just excited about this idea and you know, mm-hmm. there's no proof yet. And they didn't really know the founder. And so and I wasn't crazy about the idea, so I, I wouldn't invest. But um every deal, like I would have a different thesis on like why I was excited to do it, whether it's a team bet, whether it's on you know the, the market. And then, you know, over time was able to kind of go back and look at like, what did this work? Did it not? And, and why, why did it work or why didn't it work? Just to try to get better uh, over and over. Mm. I wonder when you're, um, I guess like um, when you're starting. So like, I think I was like listening to some of the other podcasts you've done. So in CBS, you mentioned that like you guys would um write down let's say if you guys are trying to sell to someone um like the whole team would write down like who they know or like how the decision process is made in each company and i wonder like what were the early on sales career that kind of like shape you into like how you invest and what are some lessons that you kind of took to just like establish your career in general and I think we briefly chat about like your past like history, you know, you were, um, you went to like school in Connecticut and like, I wonder like, how did that, like, how did you have, like, how do you like kind of quiz on your personal board of advisors in terms of getting into venture? And then how do you kind of map out your career in general coming from, uh, you know, uh, the university age to now? Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, I, I feel like I got good good advice. Um, I forget from where for whom, but they, they basically said like your they basically said like your your first job in these internships. You're not picking your career. Like this is mm-hmm. this is what's going to help you kind of learn what you what you want to do. Mm-hmm. And so I think that takes the pressure off of like making your life career decision. Mm-hmm. And so um, you know I was I was super active in high school and college with internships. So I. I got internships at CAA sports. I thought I wanted to be a sports agent. Mm -hmm. And then Mm -hmm. after that summer, I decided I, like, I didn't want to be a sports agent. Mm -hmm. And then I thought I wanted to work in sports on the sponsorship sales side. Um, and I actually thought maybe I, I would, would do that. Um, and so I did a lot of different internships. I looked at what I was good at, at those internships, what I was not good at, what I liked, what I got energy from, what I hated. And then when I went to, um, you know, when I was graduating college, like I went, to um i interviewed for finance roles i interviewed for sales roles um and you know like the finance roles were paying higher than the sales roles Mm -hmm. Uh, so i figured that's what i would do but i was realizing like in these interviews i it was like draining i was like this is just Mm -hmm. not what i want to do and so i'm really glad I, i took the sales roles and um you know that was basically what i learned um throughout throughout college and my first jobs was what I love is building. Like I love being in build mode early on, like figuring out how to build something. So, you know, that may be a company, but like in my case, it was a book of business. So like the first day Mm -hmm. at CBS, it it was literally like, here's the, you know, here's a big yellow book, uh, yellow pages, like Mm -hmm. make some phone calls and like drum up business. Mm -hmm. And I think that challenge of building something from scratch is something I loved. So I, I did that. And then again, when I started to work with brands and selling advertising, I would work, I could work with a big brand like Nike or Under Armour and, or I was working with at the, at the time a startup like Uber um, mm-hmm. or Seamless Grubhub. And I, again, like I loved working with these companies that were in build mode. And so there was this theme of building, building, building. Um, and then again, at Twitter, like I loved my time at Twitter and I loved my time at Reddit. The most fun I had was early again, building, building, building. And so that kind of led me to, to this, where I get to invest in, in founders who are building. And even as a firm, like we are building our firm, we're a younger firm. So it's a convoluted answer, but hopefully that touches on, on some of what you were trying to get at. Totally. Um, I saw that, you know, in at Twitter, you were um, partnering with brands like Bonobos, Harry's or Casper's and all that like famous brands now. And I wonder, um, 
how were what were you selling and then how did you pitch to these like brands yeah i mean we were i were selling um uh promoted tweets you know mm -hmm. so it was twitter's mm -hmm. ad product and so at the time we were just trying to onboard a bunch of these brands Tw twitter mm -hmm. like everyone knew who twitter was but everyone was spending basically entirely from a social perspective on on facebook and so we were trying to get people to test out twitter um and yeah, I mean, it was, to be honest, it was like pretty easy to get meetings being at, Tw people wanted to meet at Twitter, but they wanted to meet because they wanted to get verified. Like they wanted to get verified, mm -hmm. they wanted their brands to be verified on Twitter. That's why they wanted to meet mm -hmm. me. They didn't want to spend money on ads. And so we you know, had to spend a lot of time educating them on ads and how it works um, and getting them to test it and then prove out that it works. And it was, yeah, it was a, it was a, a fun, fun experience, definitely challenging competing with Facebook, who was, you know, just way larger and further ahead from an ad product standpoint. I wonder how did you quickly create a process for yourself at this stage to like sell to bigger brands? Um, the reason why I'm asking is like, I feel like venture is a sales game eventually, like, and uh, everybody is trying to upsell at some point or like sell to really popular company or sell to really popular talent or something like everybody's selling all the time so i wonder what's your thing thinking framework on um, let's say like give us like three step strategy to improve our sales ability and then building a system that you can ultimately repetitively sell to um big players in the game I mean, a, a, a huge part of it is the the prospecting, and I don't just mean I don't just mean like sending out a lot of emails. I mean being really strategic about who you email. Like you don't want to waste your time, right? So, as a salesperson at Twitter, you know, there if I was and I was specifically selling to to retailers. If there was uh, a retail, if there are two retailers, and one of them hmm. maybe it was bigger than the other, but the bigger one was not advertising on Facebook. Like they were. You know very old school and they were just doing tv ads but the other retailer was experimenting with snapchat and 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 facebook i would go after that one like they're gonna it's gonna be easier an easier conversation to get them to test twitter because they've already tested mm -hmm. these other platforms so again mm -hmm. being smart about who we reach out to who you reach out to who you spend time with because it's not about like how many meetings you get or how much time you spend with it, it it's about results at the end of the day so being really picky about who you reach out to and how you do that, um, you know, getting in the door and being uh, prepared for those meetings. So not just cookie cutter sales decks. You know, I spent would spend time trying to under trying to put myself in their shoes of like what's relevant to this brand at this point in their journey, um, and then closing the deal. Like actually, you know, getting them from interest to to, to actually buying, and so. That was, it's always a challenge to do that. But I think when you spend the time to figure out who to reach out to, um, like how to actually do something that makes sense for their business, it's it's an easier sales process because you genuinely believe like it's a good decision for them. And so do they, and they, you know, will go ahead and give it a try. Let's say if um, I'm a brand, let's say if I'm Casper and then I come to you to like trying to get my Twitter verified and what would you say to me to um, sell me to buy the promotion of Twitter? um well we you know it, it was it was a it was a song and a dance and it, it and it changed i think there was a point when i was there where in order to get verified you had to be a customer but in order to be a customer of you know a named account you had to spend a certain amount of money so it felt a little transactional but we couldn't say like spend this amount of money on ads and we'll get you verified but that's sort of what it was um, but then that changed, um, you know, because again, when I was started working there it was the wild, wild west. And then um, it became like, that has nothing to do with it. We'll submit you, but like, we can't guarantee it. And there's a separate team that does it. So we had to, we had to like lean on selling Twitter's ad platform, not just like, you're going to get verified. Um, let's say like, you know, like when they're, let's say you promote this kind of thing. It's like, would you, I guess like, my biggest fear would be like, let's say, would that, would that scare the best client away? Because the best client, like, do they want to pay? Or like, I mean, I'm sure they have budget to pay. But like, let's say, um, yeah, if you are selling them something, um, like, I guess like at the beginning, I would want to get all the logos onto 
the website first and i wonder like how would you approach that would you try to get all the logo first and then negotiate with people later or how do you what's the sales process well yeah i mean or like the, the the way it's always the way i feel like it always tends to work is like you do you do a test it's you know no no advertiser is going to spend a 20 do a sign a 20 million dollar deal up front so they they'll start with a small a small test and see how it goes and get their feet wet and tr you know try the platform and then we spend a lot of time making sure they're successful that they feel good about it that they understand it and then we you know there's a, there's a process where we try to upsell them into longer term commitments bigger deals that sort of thing but it's sort of you know it's on us to prove out the value so that they can make a good you know the the right decision for for them if they we get their feet if they get their feet wet and they feel like it wasn't a success um that's a problem so you know we've always you know in sales like it, it's not just get you know getting in the door and closing the deal it's like making sure that they're, they're really happy and they're going to kind of continue what if at the beginning it wasn't as successful as you predicted like would that be the product problem or would that be like the sales problem <laughs> would that be the customer mar like market it, fit or something it, it could be it could be any anything so you know like there there were there's always gonna be tips and tricks for how to be most successful and some customers look you know listen better than others some you mm -hmm. know uh folks had better creative teams and so that you have better creative if you have a better product and better creative uh you're going to perform better um so there mm -hmm. there's that um and then yeah of course there's a product thing so it's you know we were shipping new products you know specifically around direct response performance advertising and that that was really hard um because it's really hard to make that work and we were competing with facebook that was doing it incredibly well and so we were getting um we were being compared to them and they were doing a better job than us so it you know they were winning more budget but we were sort of like fighting for as much as we can of the of the budget because brands didn't want to rely a hundred percent on facebook they wanted other options too and they also got mm -hmm. value out of being doing unique things and trying new things and so yeah we were all learning we were shipping new products some work better than others um and yeah there were definitely advertisers that were more successful than others how do you become from, you know, a senior account executive at Reddit to head of sales? Like, uh, do you have to intentionally build a team or like, how do you kind of like um, prove yourself within a short amount of time? Yeah, well, it was it was really good timing. I mean, when I joined when I joined Reddit, um, it, you know, there's less than 50 people. The people on sales that was like less than a few people. They had just hired someone from Google to build out sales mm -hmm. and the revenue org. Um, and I reached out to him on LinkedIn and I, I expressed interest in being like, you know, one of the first sellers, but also, you know, interest in building out um, the the New York team um, because New York is just such a, it's, it's obviously a big market, but especially for, for ads, um, mm -hmm. you know, all the ad agencies are, are here. And so I, you know, I took that job with the understanding, like, I don't just want to, I want to build a team eventually when it made sense and Reddit, you started, you know, took off really quickly and we had to build a team and, you know, I was doing a good job and I was there and luckily had a, a boss who, who believed in me and, and, you know, gave me the ability to hire a team. Mm, when I guess like, how do you like, so when you're looking at startups nowadays, like how do you pick which startup to join based on your experience from the past? And um, especially like, you know, most startups are unproven, the product, especially early stage startups, let's say they are um, unproven, products are not super sad, maybe they have a really unique technology, especially living in Silicon Valley, I feel like a lot of startups have really good technical mode, but maybe they're not really e-product yet. Um, as a non-technical person, how do you kind of like, uh, let's say if you're hired by a team that's like you're the first hire as a non-engineering person on the team, uh, how do you figure out what's your role and how would you pick which company to join? Yeah. I mean, I, like it, as an employee, as an investor, or even like as, as an employee, I mean, I want to try the product, you know, I want to, I want to mm -hmm. see the product and the proof that it, 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 it works. Um, mm -hmm. One of the biggest things I would do and like I've done is, is talk to customers. So, you know, you're going to take a job with this company, you're investing your, your time and career and that sort of thing. Our customers happy with the product you know if you if you're able to and sometimes that requires you to to be kind of strategic about how to find 
who the customer is and if you have a relationship or know someone who knows someone at the company. But if you're able to talk to a, you know, a blue chip customer who says, we love this product, it's amazing, and you know, we're going to continue spending money with them, that's a great sign. But if you speak to them and they say, uh, we're, like, we're churning off this thing or it doesn't work or uh, you know, mm -hmm. that's really helpful data. So trying to get a sense of user love or not um, early on is huge. And you kind of have to get, you know, you have to get creative about doing it. So it's not just looking at the website for a quote that the company says, look at everyone loves our product. It's actually like doing back channel references. Um, and then the other thing is on the back channel side is back channel references on the team, you know, could be the founder, could be the CTO, could be whoever it is, you know, finding folks who, who worked with them before, or, you know, um, yeah, who invested in previous companies. And it doesn't always mean like you, you only go work for people where you get 10 out of 10 references because, you know, there's always going to be someone who doesn't think, you know, this person's great or had a bad experience, but use your own judgment to kind of talk to people and, and figure out. Um, I guess like when you are looking at a company or like a, when you're looking at a startup to invest in or not. So like, I guess what are, um, I guess. I guess like when you are at um when you are angel investing, maybe some of the factor are like who would who is also in the run or like is there any shiny logo or something. But um now you're at craft, it's like a in institutional fund. Um, how did the mentality shift um when you're evaluating deals and what what are things that you have learned at craft that you wouldn't be able to learn as an angel investor? Yeah, I mean as a as an angel investor, I think you know, you're, you're kind of investing, um, based on gut, you like, mm -hmm. you know, you, you meet with a founder, mm -hmm. you, you try to do some work, um, and you make a decision that's kind of angel investing, you're investing your own money. And that's, that's what you do. The, I mean, the game totally changes when you're investing other people's money, you know, professionally. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I still think like gut is maybe the most important thing, but I think, you, you know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of work and diligence that could be, you know, be worked, be looked at in conjunction with gut that kind of helps you make the best decision. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, like things like, you know, things like when, when you're an angel investor or people that I know that are angel investing right now, they may ask the company, like, what's your ARR and revenue growth rate, gross margin, like gross margins, let's say. Um, and they take that at, you know, at face values. Okay. Their gross margins are 80%. Like, that's great. I think, um, you know, like for, for us and for any professional investor, like we go deep, we look at the financials, we see how they're calculating gross margins. Sometimes a founder will say the gross margins 80% or 70%, but like when we do it, it's more like 40 or 30, you know, whatever it, it may be. So it's going really deep um, on, on financials, on references, on the market. Um, as a as a fund, also like when we invest at Craft, we we want to make sure every investment we make, if we're right about it, like it's going to return the fund. So, as mm -hmm. an angel, if there was a you know if there was a friend of mine or someone who I really like doing a business and I thought it could be a hundred, you know, they could sell it for a hundred million dollars, which would be a great outcome for them and for investors. You know, I would invest in that. But as a fund, as a you know billion dollar plus fund, like we we need to make sure every company that we invest in, if it works, like it can be a, a billion dollar plus exit. So oftentimes we'll pass on companies where we think the founder and team is great, but you know, the market's not big enough to support a huge, huge outcome. Mm. Can you talk about, um, maybe use any of the deal that you have invested in? Like, how do you find out about the deal? And then how do you, I guess, how do you benchmark if some, a company is going to be a billion dollar plus if it's like in a very early stage? Yeah. I mean, listen, there's no, again, this is why, you know, and you probably, we've all heard a million stories where, mm -hmm. you know, someone, someone passed on Uber or Airbnb because they thought no way this is a big enough market or it's going to work and, you know, look at them now. Um, so no, like there's no perfect silver bullet, but um, I think, you know, you, you can make an educated guess on some of these, these things. So Certain markets, every market's different. Um, you know, being able to do kind of a bottom-up analysis of like how big that market is, if they capture a certain percentage of the market, then like how realistic is it that they're actually going to do that? Who are they competing against? How much money are they going to have to spend to actually get there? You know, all of all of these these things matter. Um, you know, we mm -hmm. spend a lot of time going deep on. You know, we we do a lot of like Series A, Series B, and growth investing. We spend so we we typically have some data 
um, there's revenue, there's data, there's engagement data. We like I want to see how often the you know uh, the customers are using the product. It's great that mm -hmm. maybe a company has a million dollars of revenue, but like are they are they actually using it? Because that's a leading indicator of if they're going to renew or you know be mm -hmm. upsold or churn that sort of thing. Um, so. And then again, like every company is different, every space is different. And so some of the, the diligence may be, may be different, a little bit different based on the stage of the company or the sector that they're in. Um, now, when you're looking at deals, do you do, let, let's say, um, do you do like a market map or something and then you go find them? Or do you, let's say, are you more of like a people approach? Let's say you are, um, you identify a couple, um, let's say, earlier stage investor, they're great to um, getting their deal flow and then just trust the network. Um, how do you, what's your approach in terms of investing now? Yeah, so um, everyone's different. We, we always are gonna do a market map no matter what. I, I'd say like everyone does it differently. So I, I do, like I have partners and there are folks at the firm that where they, that, you know, they'll start with the market map and go super, super deep on markets and go from there. Mm -hmm. I, I tend to be someone I love picking people um, and mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I don't necessarily start with like a specific uh, niche market that I'm like really digging into. Sometimes that does happen organically, but it usually stems from like I meet a company or a founder and I start getting really interested in a space and then go go deep into it. But personally, I'm I'm super focused on finding, you know, outlier special founders whatever it is that they're building um and i want to meet them and understand what they're doing and you know look for them to kind of inspire you know get me excited about it that's how i go about it i think again every investor is different and has different skill sets um but i found over time like that's that's how i like to do things when you're picking people would you say you're picking like um let's say founders or like past founders or like past like you know important talent let's say first hire of like a public company or something or um i mean i i was reading some of your blogs from like 2021 i saw that like you have invested in like a former let's say first hire of sales in a company and then they are like they founded a company and um i wonder like do you i guess like how what does your personal crm look like to track the best um, founders, um, would, would it be like, you know, top 100 operators at top 100 company, or would it be like top 100, um, Android investors? How, what does it, what, what is it, what does it look like for you to create a system to get the important talents? Or yeah, like, I mean, listen, if it, 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 it's, it's not, it's not as, if it was as simple as, you know, like, engineer who went to XYZ school who worked at Google or P, you know, whatever it is, like it, this job would be super easy. And you know, listen, a lot of people do that. A lot of investors, you know, just look at who was a, you know, who's a PM at Google or was an engineer at Snap. And if they start a company, you know, that, that that's fine. Like those, those backgrounds are great. And those could be unicorn founders. But I also like, personally, I don't, I don't need those things to, to get excited mm -hmm. about a founder. Um, I often will get excited if, you know, the founder has a, like a random background. They grew up in, you know, somewhere like not in San Francisco and they didn't go to a tier one school and they didn't, you know, be a PM at, at one of the big tech companies. I would totally be willing um, to, to, to bet on, on them de depending on, on, on them, like their experience mm -hmm. and what they're excited about and, and basically convincing me that they're the right person to build this business. Um, so it's, it's hard for me to articulate, like, this is the model I, I look for. I think there's certain characteristics I look for. So it's, it's less, it's less about where did you, you know, grow up or go to school or work. It's more like, you know, are you relentless? Are you strategic? Will people want to work with you for you? Can you close deals? Can you get, you know, if you're not technical, can you recruit a technical co-founder? All these different things. Again, it's, like this is if if anyone if someone could just be right 100 percent of the time this job would be easy but that's what makes this so difficult uh you know in, in terms of picking mm. um how do you build a investing network when you first started um so we could talk about maybe like when you were first starting like investing on your own and then how you establish like riverside ventures to you know how you evolve into craft like i guess like what's the approach to intentionally build up this 
track record and network um, if you're doing yeah. it today? Yeah. I mean, I like, so I, when I was starting on AngelList, like I, I'd reach out to Zach Elias, um, who's a great mm -hmm. investor and was one of the original AngelList syndicate leads. And you, I invested in some on the show. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. So, um, like, I reached out to him because I wanted to learn more. And so like, what, you know, what was in it for, for him to take time with me? I mean, well, first of all, he's a really great guy and is willing to kind of give back. But I was also, you know, trying to like hoping I could refer him some great deals. Um, and he thought maybe, you know, maybe I could. So was able to learn from him and start building a network, you know, network like that, like Zach, but, you know, he was someone I wanted to get to know and would reach mm -hmm. out. Um, there are also just other, other, people that were kind of like coming up maybe they were they were around my age um or had similar um types of experiences or they lived in new york and i re would reach out like it wasn't you know like every single person says absolutely let's meet and you know become best friends and share deals but a subset of them you know did and i was able to learn a lot through them and again like i would try to be as helpful as i as i could and as helpful as i could to investors for the most part was me sharing deals with them um, and they, you know, they appreciated it and I learned a lot. And, you know, th these are some of the people that I still stay in close contact with now. Um, when you are sharing deals with people, I guess like I have two questions. One is like as a deal receiver, um, let's say if it's a sector that you don't understand, but it's referred by a, let's say an angel you look up to, and you're also like just starting out, like, would you invest in that deal to quote unquote learn? Or like, would you like sit, like set aside some time to like think about it? And then like, after you've seen, let's say five deals or so, or like, um, after you like do some research in the sector to move forward with a particular deal, I guess like, how, how do you interact with, how do you like judge uh, or do yeah. due diligence on other people's deal? And the second part of the question is like, um, how much deal do you have to share to, until like someone shares some, a deal with you at the beginning before you have, you know, all the amazing brands uh, of it is today. Yeah. Well, listen, I think, I think like early on when you're, when you're like an associate at a venture fund, like it's just natural. You talk to other associates and analysts and principals and you kind of like share deal flow. That's obviously not the way to find the best deals ever because you're, you know, you're not going to share mm -hmm. th your, the best deal ever. Um, mm -hmm. You're going to kind of keep it for yourself, but it's a way to start kind of like getting in the flow of things and learning and getting, getting, getting reps. Um, so, you know, I think that's, that's one thing, uh, you know, on the, the first part of your question, like, would, would I, you know, we, we tend to focus on B2B SaaS and marketplaces because mm -hmm. that's what we know best. Right. And we could, we, we can be most helpful there. We also could diligence it, you know, quickly and efficiently because we know what we're looking for. Um, when we look at something we don't know as well, it's, har it's harder for us to diligence, um, but would we invest in something we aren't like ex experts in? Yes, but the, I think the bar is higher. Um, and so we would, um, you know, we would spend a lot, we would have to spend a lot of time getting smarter about the space. We would probably mm -hmm. bring in folks to help us diligence it that who are experts. Um, sometimes if I'll get a deal that's not completely down the middle for me. I have another partner at Craft where it is and like I'll refer to them or we work on it together. Um, but I just say like the bar, the bar is higher. The other thing is like, am I excited enough about it? So uh, if it's something a bit out there, like, am I passionate enough about it to spend the time to get really deep and smart on this? And, you know, it may be a good investment opportunity, but if I can't diligence it and I'm not willing to put in the time, like I'm not, we're not going to invest. So, the, so I'd say yes, but the bar is just higher for anything that's not down the middle. Mm, when, when you were first um, starting as a, like emerging angel back time back in time or an emerging um like uh basically emerging investor back in time um so do you think like when you invest in let's say a slack or a carta that was already like kind of famous or like how like if it's already famous how do you get into the deal like what's your networking process to um be a part of deal like this um since it's going to be competitive and if it's a company that you have found that's like unknown but now it's known as like a really famous company um how do you evaluate these companies to um be a part of the game 
Um, well, I mean, every, again, I, like they're all they're all different different examples. So, like some some of you know, there, there's been some of these like late stage names that have been things um, that I've that I've done because I knew an investor on the cap table and was able to get in. Um, you know, one of the the companies um, invested that we that I invested in personally as an angel was Citizen, which is like the crime fighting app. And I just mm -hmm. I was a user of it. And I like it was blowing up in, in New York and different cities and got super, super excited about it. And I just like I worked my butt off to be helpful enough to kind of meet the founder and spend time with them. And I mean, that like that deal, I ended up investing in it. Um, I think it was between when Sequoia did it and, and like 8VC or something like that. But I mean, there's years of like spending time with the founder and the team getting to getting to know them because they just they didn't need money. They weren't raising. Um, you know, we literally like I went out one night like patrolling for crime to test new features with him. Um, I wasn't an investor, like it was relationship building. And so ultimately got got into the the deal. And that was by the way, like a super competitive deal. A lot of funds were trying to get into it, um, but was able to kind of build enough rapport with the founder to, to actually do that. Um, when you are thinking about like allocating your money and time, um, how do you like, do you spend like, let's say, or like, okay, another quick question on the, um, like basically really famous deal now, like, you know, if let's say, um, open AI, like have some secondary in a platform or something, you got open, open AI secondary, would you purchase it to build a track record? Or would you say like, if you want to build a track record, just invest in very early stage deals? I mean, I think I think the market is smart enough to know if you're like logo shopping. So if you you know if you invest and buy secondary shares in these like open AIs of the world at this point, um, I don't know that anyone is going to give you credit for being a genius. You know for finding them early, mm -hmm. but like, will is it a logo you put on your website and it looks good and can maybe be helpful? Like the the reality is 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 yes. But I think most sophisticated investors and LPs and founders, you know, they 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 know that i think what's more important is just like you know if you know you if that if that's a certain funder angel investor but they've actually been helpful to the team or the founder that you know that's that's great but i i wouldn't i wouldn't do that as a strategy um you know i did i invested in a couple of super late stage companies um but i wasn't like it wasn't out of logo hunting it was just like pre-ipo shares that i thought i could make it was a good investment um and so I would, I'd say it's better to focus on early stage companies that people may not know it's going to be more valuable for, for you, um, reputationally, but also financially. Um, but, uh, yeah, if there's a late stage company and you feel like you have a unique perspective on, uh, and think it's going to do well, I, I don't think, you know, it's a terrible idea to pursue that either. Mm, how, like, so there's a lot of people who have good track record why do you feel like you stand out among the crowd to you know uh now you're a partner at craft how do you kind of like um what do you identify as your unfair advantage to um be an investor yeah i mean i you know i i'm i'm working on it like it's still you know it's still early i you know i i prefer to let the results speak speak for itself um but i try to find the right the right fit i mean at the end of the day like what we're doing is we are providing capital um and capital to an extent is a commodity and so we need to be unique in terms of why why take money from us instead of someone else and so we work really hard on on doing that when we, you know, oftentimes we'll we'll talk with founders and share how we think we could help them. Every company is different. How how we get involved and how we could be helpful is going to be different based on the company, based on where they need help. Um, and so, you know, we'll do that, and then we'll let them talk to, to talk to founders. So it's just it's not really like you know my style or our style to say here's why we're the the best ever. We kind of let the results do the talking for itself. If let's say if Craft is not in the Bay Area and you're entering the Bay Area, um, how would you build a differentiated fund among the crowd? Sorry, the question is: is if you were building a, a like a if new you're fund, like, not... yeah, let, let's say if Craft started in the New York area or somewhere else, and then they are trying to enter Silicon Valley, how would you go about the go-to-market for a fund? 
I don't know that there's like that much of a go to market, honestly, just because, you know, it's like, like zoom and people are traveling. And so whether you're in San Francisco or New York or LA or Austin, like, I, I don't think that's the biggest deal. I think it's just a matter of like, you know, a lot of my, you know, the folks I'm closest with, they happen to be in New York where I am, um, where, you know, David started this in San Francisco, a lot of his network and, and relationships are in San Francisco, but I, I don't know that it's like that huge of a, of a deal, um, you know, to, to like enter a new market, so to speak. When you are, um, let's say like, what are some key factors that you would judge a company today? So let's say like three basic factors um, when you're evaluating deals. Yeah, I mean, uh, growth. So like ARR growth. I mean, at the end of the day, we need, you know, venture capital. Like we're, this is a home run game. So we're looking for huge outcomes. And so companies need to be growing really fast, especially because we're primarily investing early. So, you know, growing something like three or four X year over year, um, you know, in the, the, this new world, like we were, you know, when it was ZERP and it was all about, like, it used to always be growth, growth, growth. And now it's still like, there's still growth, but it's mm -hmm. also efficiency. Um, and so we look at something called burn multiple, which basically measures how much you are spending or burning to generate new revenue. And that's a, that is a really important metric for us to look at because if we see a company is growing really nicely, um, that's great, but we want to see that it's efficient too. So if they're not efficient, they need to raise a ton of money um, and it's not super sustainable, but if they are efficient, that that's, that's, you know, really great. Um, and then, um, you know, I'd also say like uh, repeatability. So the, a lot of companies have the ability, you know, they're, it's not easy to get to a million dollars of, of ARR or 5 million, but at the end of the day, like when we invest, it's not to get to one or five or 10, it's like a hundred plus. And so to get the conviction that they're going to be able to build a process, hire out a team and kind of re rinse and repeat what they're doing to kind of get to that hundred million dollar plus that's um, spend a lot of time trying to kind of just gut check on if that's how likely that is or not. And, you know, oftentimes there's a lot of companies we look at where we can see it getting to five, 10, 20 million, but have a much harder time seeing it get to get to a hundred plus. What are questions that you would ask in the diligence process to um, assess these um, different, the growth trajectory and are they able to scale in general? Yeah, well, so we actually, so we we built something in house and then actually um, incubated a company out of it that we invested in SaaS Grid. So we we basically are able to like we ask companies for a couple of very basic things, um, such as like a monthly P and L uh, and revenue by customer monthly. And what SaaS Grid does is basically takes that and spits out all the charts that matter. And so it helps us look at things like growth and gross margin, uh, efficiency metrics. Um, so, we've, and that's actually like, you can go on and, and try it out. Anyone could, could do it. Um, but it's a really good way of kind of just gut checking, you know, is, is it healthy growth or not? Same thing with like churn, really understanding our customers expanding, are they not? Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. Like when you speak with some companies and management teams and they present the numbers the way they want to present it. And then when you like kind of look under the hood and really dissect it, sometimes it's like two very different stories, not always, but sometimes it's just two very different stories. Um, and sometimes it just, it just leads to a certain questioning path where, you know, like, th like this is the area where there's a question mark and we need a really diligent, you know, diligence. Is this, is this going to be an issue or is this fixable or is this the reality? That sort of thing. Um, how do you like, so for the, um, like for the earlier stage company, when they don't have much of a metrics, um, like what are you, what would you, how would you evaluate these companies in a more earlier stage before they have yeah. uh, revenue and stuff? Yeah. So like, as I, as I, as I said, like team, 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 like it's all about the, it's always like the founder is the most important part in the team is, but, he, but at, at the early stage, it's even weighted even more so because that's, sometimes mm -hmm. really all you have but there is other stuff so even if it's too early for revenue and you know to really dig into the financials there's still uh there's still things like what have you what have you done what have you built where what are you project like where how are you thinking about about 
these you know issues or or opportunities and you could kind of get a sense for how they're thinking about it you know sometimes we'll meet a, a founder and like they just thought it all through and like I, we ask for something and like they have an answer um but sometimes you know like they've been working on something for three years and there's not a product like that's a that's a concern you know so like mm -hmm. why all of a sudden now are you going to be able to build a product when you haven't done that for three years but if it's really early and they've done something whether you know even if it's on figma or whatever it is um you know that's you know we're looking for kind of signs for that um what are some like you know like i'm sure there are companies that you have invested may that may not pan out as like as well so what do you see as um let's say a major common thing that you feel like would lead a company to uh not go so well um I'd say velocity. So in a, in a couple of senses, so shipping product, like we need to, you need to ship product fast and iterate and like, you gotta move really fast period. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I think a lot of, a lot of, not every team can do that. And especially, you know, like big tech often is known not to do that. And a lot of founders come from big tech, mm -hmm. but it's also just moving quickly on decisions. So, Things like, you know, there are, t I think a lot of companies spend too much time on, should we pivot or should we not? Should we make this higher or should we fire? You, like, you got to move fast. You have to iterate quickly. And so uh, I've seen like companies that just take too long to make the hard decisions. You know, it's part of like, you know, the investor and the board's role sometimes is to kind of like push them in that direction. But that's the biggest thing is the company waited too long to pivot, to make a change in leadership. Uh, to make a pricing change, whatever it is, it's it's kind of that sense of urgency and actually like pulling the trigger. Mm. Let's say if you have invested in a company that's like with a really strong technical mode, but may not be, let's say the founders are not like sales driven or something, how would you help them to develop like a sales strategy and um, a product that can be sold? Well, Ulti like I, I well first of all like you're you're always going to need sales and go to market expertise so you're gonna you're gonna have to hire someone in in mm -hmm. that role eventually but if there is a gap between like when you realistically could get that person you know and, and that sort of thing then yeah we'll work really closely i mean so literally thing you know bu building out a process around outbound um automation you know how to actually structure these meetings like a lot of this like sales 101 stuff um you know, I'll do, and we have other folks on the team who have actually done sales enablement. Um, so we'll 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 get really hands on. We've done you know interviews for 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 folks um, and practice pitches, but we'll get as hands on as we need to. But definitely at some point, like someone's going to have to own it and be exceptional at it, and we're going to have to help hire that person. Would you hire? Let's say if in your portfolio, would you hire someone with a sales like experience in the past? Let's say like a big tax sales director or something to join an early stage company or would you think like it should be like a person that's also unproven because it's technically a startup it can it have to need to try a lot of different things to get someone who's scrappy and like can do that can do like a lot of groundwork to test things out yeah and yeah i mean it's it's you know oftentimes it's going to early on it's going to be someone a little earlier in their career that's kind of able and willing to to do a lot of these cold emails and calls the, the you know, I don't know how many like senior directors of sales that a big tech company is going to come in and, and do that, even if they say they are willing to. Um, and so I'm not saying it's, an, it's impossible, but generally it's like someone who's more of an up and comer, who's hungry, who's coachable, who's kind of willing and, and able to kind of do that. Cause the other thing is, is early on, like you want, you want a lot of volume. So you learn. So that, you know, when you're early and you have a product and you're trying to find product market fit, if, uh, you know, your salesperson has one meeting a day, you know, that's one piece of feedback, customer feedback a day. That's not enough. If you're talking to 10 customers a day. You know, that's a lot of feedback and it can mm -hmm. really, it, it's, it goes far beyond revenue and sales, but also like product direction, marketing materials, that sort of thing. Mm. If you're, let's say, doing like, uh, not you, but like, let's say one of your portfolio is doing like a chat GPT competitor, would you say like, or launching some sort of AI product, um, 
would you say they should get a lot of crowd like cloud first let's say you know what um a lot of these like ai company they just launch with a link and then become like hugely popular um would you say like it should be like marketing first and product you kind of revamp the product later based on customer feedback or would you say it's like uh talking to customer at smaller scale first before they launch a really like popular consumer product yeah i mean i think it's it's <clears throat> products definitely the most important thing but you need both like you know if you have a good product with zero distribution and no one's using it like that's an issue too so it's it's probably somewhere in the middle um you know mm -hmm. the product doesn't need to be perfect like like that's a could be a separate issue if you're a perfectionist and don't ship a product until it's perfect you're never going to ship it but if you're all marketing and hype and you just kind of sign up for a wait list or have something bare bones like people are gonna are gonna leave so it's gotta it's gotta be be both that's why like teams matter it's very very rare to have one founder who's kind of great at everything um and so you know we look for a lot of times it's teams and it's co-founders and co-founders with executives who kind of have different different skill sets um i want to ask one real question and then we'll uh, jump into a one minute fire on so um when you are looking at let's say um if a like when you're in since you have been investing for a long time so you probably seen a ceo grow from like uh um you know three people in a garage to uh later stage um how do a successful ceo evolve when they were like a first-time founder how do they quickly educate themselves or um maybe like also other like operator on the team how do they quickly educate themselves to become a leader at their larger scale of a company they they for the most part they're spending a lot of time with folks that are that are a step or two ahead of them um throughout the the journey and so they're learning a lot about what they don't know what they you know they're, they're kind of like learning all the the tricks um you know tricks and tips and traps basically and they're just curious and they're 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 humble enough they're, they're kind of like confident enough to ask for help but also humble enough to like receive receive the help um exec coaches like is a is a is a game changer for for a lot of a lot of folks um i'd say also being just realistic with yourself knowing what you're good at and what you're not and where you're going to need help um that's a big thing it's you know when it, i think you run into trouble when when a founder is um when they have a blind spot and they you know there's some real challenges and they just kind of refuse to to, to kind of hire around that mm. um when you mentioned like um getting a uh getting basically surround themselves with like a person's a step or two step ahead of them um let's say if i'm a brax like uh if i'm like uh i don't know like a ceo of brax at like you know 20 years ago or something not 20 years ago like five years ago when brax first started and then should i like who, who should i consult with to like keep going with the career because i probably wouldn't be able to get someone from mercury ramp or some like similar people like a similar in their industry right like should they go for let's say um a sales director at google or something like how how should they pick the mentor who is a step or two step ahead of them yeah i mean well it, it it depends on on the company so you know for example if it's a company that is getting ready to ipo it would be someone who at some point was at that a com another company that went to ipo a similar stage but it does not i do not think it has to be in the exact same vertical that's you know no one's gonna i, I don't think this is less less about um like how to run your business because every business is very different, even if it's in the same category. It's just, it's just some of the softer skills of, you know, what do I do? You know, I have to hire an, you know, an executive over another long-term executive and they're not going to be happy about it. And how am I going to manage it? Cause they're important. Or, you know, how do I communicate this tough news with the company? Because it's, you know, I don't know if they could handle it, but I want to be, be realistic. So I just think there's some of these questions and topics that only people who have gone through it and have learned like, um, you know what what the right approach was is is gonna actually work amazing okay where are the one minute last one minute fire round for you so what's your favorite book um uh, favorite book uh hard thing about hard things uh who would you invite to your dinner party would i invite to my dinner party uh larry david uh 
That's a great answer. Uh, who made the biggest impact in your career? Um, I will give a give a, a tie um, to my boss at Reddit Zubair um, and my boss at CAA, Paul Danforth. They did a lot for me and taught me a lot. Um, very thankful for them. Uh, where can we find you outside of work? Say that again. Where can we find you outside of work? Uh, probably a Mets or Knicks game. Amazing. Thank you so much, Brian, for coming on the show today. Thank you, Grace. Let me quickly.